Hey guys, hi, welcome back to my channel. It's me, Steven. So it has been a week since I filmed a video and uh, that feels like a real long time for me. So I figured I would sit down today and film a little vlog. Uh, but I did not have really, I could not muster the energy to make the video I had planned. Uh, it would have involved too many notes and thinking too hard. Um, <laughs> I wanna make a video which doesn't sound hard, about sleeping and being a flight attendant. I know. So if you're going to be a flight attendant or want to be a flight attendant, um, it's something that you may find interesting. Um, it, there's a lot to it. You'd be surprised. Uh, but um, for my subscribers and for those folks who watch my videos and don't subscribe yet, um, this will be a very different video than my typical uh, content. So there's no flight attendant content here. Um, I won't be talking about my cat, although he did just come in from his walk, so you might hear him. Um, but uh, I did want to film a video, but I really just couldn't muster the energy of making uh, a very um, planned, thought out video. <laughs> I know you're laughing because most of my videos don't sound planned or well thought out, but um, so today I figured since you guys um, are getting to know me more and more with each of my videos and uh, some of you seem interested in me most of you seem interested in my cat <laughs> but I thought I would share um, one of the most interesting things that's ever happened to me certainly the scariest thing that's ever happened to me um, and um, I, it'd be an interesting story I thought I'd, I thought I'd share it uh, I am I keep threatening you with um, my story about me um, getting sober and my recovery I am gonna make a video about that sometime soon uh, but this is the other serious video I'll be filming so I'm not quite sure how I'm going to title this, but it will be something like, uh, so there's this one time I almost died or something like that. So let's set the time and the place for the story time here. Um, I'm thinking I might show you my scar. I have a scar to ruin the surprise. Um, I might share, I might show you that scar if I can manage to lift my <laughs> myself into the screen without sharing too much of my body uh, because I have not been to the gym in almost two months. Uh, I know it's disappointing. Um, but um, so let's let's talk about time and place. Um, this happened in Jamaica Plain, which is right outside of uh, Boston. It's technically part of Boston, right on the orange line um, at the Stony Brook tea stop. Um, it was, sorry for the airplanes, they're passing over and my door is open like this so the cat can come in and out. Um, so it was August 11th, 2007. Yes. Uh, and, um, I had spent the day with one of my sponsees. Um, I, um, I have been sober for five years and, and sponsoring or mentoring, uh, guys in sobriety for about five years. And um, this kid that I was uh, sponsoring then was uh, had a, a brain injury, which has nothing to do with this story. Um, but uh, I had spent that whole day, it was a long day, with him and his classmates uh, preparing for a theater production um, of young people with varying stages of brain injuries. And uh, I, through some of the uh, last minute rehearsals and three shows in a row, I spent the entire day there so he could have some sort of, you know, support. And I was happy to do it, but I was wiped out. So after I sent him off with his, uh, him, he, him and his classmates to his school, um, I made my way home and uh, jumped on the orange line to um, get to Jamaica Plain where I was living. So um, if you if you happen to know the orange line in uh, Jamaica Plain, I was getting off the Stony Brook stop. And if you look across the street, there's a little park with, um, I think there are basketball courts in the back. Um, and there's a diagonally, there's a sort of a slightly wind, uh, winding little path. It's not sort of a, a beaten dirt path. It's a paved walkway with plenty of bright lighting. And it's typically, sorry for that plane, typically pretty much a thoroughfare for pedestrians to get 
from the Sterling Brook tea stop into the surrounding neighborhood. It's not like I was walking in a dangerous, unknown area. Um, Jamaica Plain, I'm not sure if it's like this still, but it was hipster haven. Everyone, well, I didn't have a beard then, but everyone has a beard and wears funny hats like this, and I look like a hipster. You know, uh, um, has cats. I'm becoming a hipster. Um, it was... It was totally not a dangerous area. So I did not suspect that I'd be putting myself in danger by walking home that night. Um, I was wearing uh, my iPod. I had like a that touch wheel iPod. This is 2007. Uh, and I was wearing my headphones, which is something I don't ever suggest you ever do ever in public at nighttime. Uh, because this might not have happened had I heard this kid coming up behind me. Uh, but I was listening to Shaka Khan. Uh, the song was I Live You, I Love You. Great song. And um, out of nowhere, I'm just walking along, probably singing, because no one was really around. Uh, and uh, out of nowhere, um, I thought someone punched me, like right, actually, exactly right here. Um, I had been punched in the face, which hurts. Uh, I was punched in the chest here, and the air the air was just knocked right out of me. Another airplane. Uh, the air was knocked right out of me. I was stunned uh, and surprised. Uh, and so I'm going to tell the story uh, as much as I can in a linear fashion. But if you've ever been a victim of a violent crime, you know that the the whole story can happen in a split second, and it can feel very weird. Um, but, uh, so I thought someone had punched me because I've never been punched in the chest here of all places. And, um, and just out of nowhere, this kid pops up. He had come up from behind on my left hand side. Um, and he just popped up in front of me, this kid with a hoodie. I couldn't describe him. I know he wasn't Asian, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, he could have been uh, Hispanic. He could have been black. He could have been anything. I don't know. Kid in a hoodie. Um, and all I remember seeing is a knife. And honestly, I, I probably should have, for dramatic uh, purposes, pulled out a similar knife because I have one in my kitchen. But think psycho. That that chef's knife that it's it's like an inch and a half wide. It's like that. Um, that giant knife with a wooden handle with the little brass rivets in it, that kind of knife. Um, he's holding it up in front of him and he's like, give me your money, give me your money. And I, I, I just reacted. I gave him my wallet, uh, and I had a, um, a messenger bag on it. It was an Andy Warhol. I missed this bag. It was an Andy Warhol, sort of a printed cotton with like, um, you know, Louis Vuitton, that kind of finish, that polyurethane finish. Um, it was um, cows. It was covered in his cow pattern. Uh, I gave him that bag, which had everything else of value I had on me, including my house keys. Uh, I gave him that bag, my wallet. I didn't have any other money on me. And I, um, and I gave him those things. And as I'm giving him these things, and it must have happened at the same moment, that I start to realize the sensation of what's really happening over here and that he hadn't punched me, but that knife that he was holding up in front of me was what had just gone inside of my chest. And the um, there was this, I was suddenly very aware of this pumping. And I'm sorry if you're grossed out by stories about blood. You probably shouldn't have watched this video. <laughs> Uh, this pumping, uh, arterial pumping of blood, hot. I mean, it's hot. And it rushing down my side uh, and then suddenly cooling off very much when it actually hit my um, my jeans and my belt and then uh, down into my, my uh, thigh. Uh, so um, he says, I'm trying to think, oh, I'm trying to get around him because I now I know that I've just been stabbed in the chest. I'm not thinking very clearly, but I know I need to get to other people to help me because something's going to happen, right? Uh, and so I try to move around him. And, you know, mind you, I'm, I was probably 40 pounds heavier than I am right now. 
uh, I wasn't in great shape and um, I wasn't moving very fast and he was much younger than I am. So he was like, no, jumped in front of me with a knife and he says, you're going that way. And he pointed behind me. I wanted to get to the subway station to get help. He also wanted to get to the subway station to get away and he didn't want some bleeding old man chasing after him yelling, please stop him, he just stabbed me. So he said, you're going that way, which is down towards Amory Street, which is the direction I was actually walking. Um, but he's like, you're going that way. And I looked him in the eye and I, you know, and you see this in the movies all the time. And I've seen things like this happen in the movies where, where someone is attacked and they beg for their life. You see it in the movies. I looked at this kid and I still couldn't even tell you what it looked like, but I looked him in the eye and I said, please, I don't want to die. Please. And he said, you're going that way. So I had to go. I mean, I had no, I wasn't going to, and he's like threatened with a knife again. And I'm like, I had no choice. So I'm holding my side at this point because I realized that I'm bleeding a lot. I, um, all I remember is seeing the tops of my shoes, uh, uh, cause I'm looking down, I'm walking, I'm like head down, walking towards the street, trying not to think of what's happening down here too much. And all I see are my shoes walking on the pine needles and how slippery the pine needles were and how I was already starting to lose, not consciousness, but me, you know, I was probably going into shock. And um, so I get to Amory Street, which is deserted. There isn't a soul on the street. A car is driving down Amory Street towards me. And I stop and I'm holding my chest with one hand. And I put my hand out, put my hand out. And I'm like, please, please, please. The car stops, big giant white car. The window rolls down. That's how old the car was. And um, I said to the driver, I said, please help me. I've been stabbed. And he just shook his head and took off. And so now I'm like, and you know, I don't, I don't judge the guy. I don't, I don't know what, what was going on with him now. I did judge him then, <laughs> but looking back, who knows? He could have had a warrant out for his arrest. He didn't want to get involved. Maybe the person who was still around, you know, um, with a knife, I don't know. So whatever he took off and I'm just looking around like I need to go somewhere. And, um, there's this house um, with a light on over the, the front door. And so I walked to that house. And at this point, um, I'm getting very weak. I can't really breathe. And so I just pounded on the door a couple times as hard as I could. And I said, as loudly as I could, please help me. Apparently, the woman across the street heard me. Um, so apparently, she called the paramedics first. She called 911 first. Uh, but the, um, a woman, I wasn't going to get emotional. <laughs> a woman answered the door. She was brave enough to answer the door. Thank God. Because it's dark. It's a Friday night in, you know, a, a weird neighborhood. Um, she did not have to answer the door for her own safety, you know. But she answered the door. She opened the door and there I was. So she came out and, um, She's and uh, then her husband comes out and he's in a bathrobe, shaved head, which I'll come to. I'll, I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, and um, I, I don't know, remember where the towel came from, but they're handing me a towel. I'm holding the towel to my chest and um, they're like, sit down, sit down. The paramedics are coming. Sit down. And I think, you know, in the movies, if you sit down, you're dead. You sit. If I sit down. I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to die. So I'm, I'm like, I'm not sitting down and I'm walking around and pacing around, around their little porch and then down on the sidewalk. And, um, I have to remember to tell you about that too. Um, and it just seemed like moments later, like seconds later, this, uh, ambulance pulls up and just out of, I don't, I can't remember them putting me on a gurney. I don't remember it happening because I would not have laid down willingly. Um, but they made me lie down. And all I remember about the the parrot, the ride to the hospital is the um, one of the EMTs is holding my forearm like this with his hand and I'm holding his like this. And he's holding my arm gently but firmly, calmingly, you know. 
And the other ENT in the back is looking at my wound and, and I hear the other, the guy who's holding my arm um, yell, don't do that. Apparently there was a lump of like fat and tissue poking out of the hole. I know, so gross. Uh, and he was about to push it back in, I guess, to be neat. I don't know. But apparently for, you know, infection and things like that, you don't want to do that. Whatever. So um, I'm, we're speeding to the hospital. I don't remember their drive. It wasn't very long because it's a hospital that's close by. Brigham and Women's. Um, wonderful place. And, uh, and uh, what happened? And the guy, the EMT was as calmly as he could. And thank God he was like looking me right in the eyes. And he's saying, when you get to the hospital, they're going to come out of the woodwork. They're going to cut your clothes off of you. They're going to, they're going to just swarm over you. So don't be startled. Don't be afraid. And thank God he told me that because that's exactly what happened. So, you know, in the movies, you watch that from the patient's point of view on a gurney moving through the hospital corridors, the, the, the lights flash, you know, the, the, the uh, fluorescent bulbs as you pass under them. That's exactly what I'm watching, right? And I'm just sort of almost out of body here. It's so crazy. Um, next thing I remember is um, I, they are trying to... I had to sign... This is the most frustrating thing that ever, almost ever happened to me. I had to... Um, I, you know, I never realized, why am I wearing this dumb hat? Um, notice my good tight beard. I know it's, <laughs> I just looked in the view, viewfinder. I'm really liking my beard today. Um, all right. So, um, before they could do anything, because I was by myself, there's no one with me before they could take any action, life-saving action or whatever, they had to make sure that I was aware of the extent of my injuries that they were, were aware of and what they were going to do about those injuries. And I had to sign a, a waiver or something to let them do it. Then all I remember is um, they couldn't give me anything for pain uh, because they didn't know what was going on. Um, and um, while they were doing this, they were trying to give me an epidural. Um, uh, oh, 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 before the epidural, before the epidural, um, they searched my pockets and found my cell phone. Now, for those people who, like especially older people, who say, I keep my cell phone with me just in case of an emergency, I'll tell you a secret. In an emergency situation, the last thing that's going to come to mind is, where's my cell phone? The first thing that will come to mind is, get me out of here. <laughs> so I did not know that I had my cell phone in my pocket. It's almost always in my bag. So they found my cell phone. They're getting me to uh, the to uh, get this epidural done, and the nurse is trying. This is 2007. It's a razor or a razor two. I don't remember. And she's. I'm trying to tell her how to scroll through phone numbers to find my sponsor, who is really the like closest thing to family I had in um, nearby, and the only person I wanted at the time. I also um, mistakenly asked them to call my mother. Um, so they, they apparently call, contacted my sponsor because it seemed like 30 seconds later, my sponsor was by my side. Funny the things I can tell you and joke and laugh. And then the things that just make me want to cry. My sponsor was there within seconds and he's not in great health. He can hardly walk without a cane. And somehow he managed to fly to my side and he stood by me the whole time he could. Um, but they're giving me this epidural and they couldn't get it. You know, they kept trying to tap, 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 tap. And I am getting, I am, my safe place for a long time was rage. And I'm like, do get the effing thing done. Cause I was in a lot of pain and, uh, they just couldn't seem to get it done. Eventually they must've gotten it done cause I was in less pain. But so what were my injuries? So this carving knife had gone in, right? Oh, what the heck? I'm going to show you my scar. Okay, don't laugh at my belly. All right, can you see? Oh, right there. Can you see that? There's also a couple little scars up there from where the chest tubes were. Um, so the carving knife had gone uh, through my ribs, through my left lung, uh, and then um, 
it went, I'm not sure where the spleen is here, but it went across my spleen, the top lobe of my spleen. I don't know what a spleen looks like. I did get to keep my spleen, by the way, if you know how important, <laughs> important a spleen is. Uh, but most importantly, and, and the most damaging, uh, is that the knife had sliced my, di my diaphragm. It sliced down my diaphragm. I have asthma anyway, especially stress-induced asthma. And a carving knife moving through my chest is stressful. So I was um, probably going into shock. Um, I uh, had my diaphragm cut open. And I am literally struggling to breathe. And when I couldn't breathe, when I can't breathe, I get angry. It's just like this adrenaline rush. And it was just, just horrifying. And um, they gave me a nebulizer, which I was trying to, to um, use because I couldn't breathe very well. Um, and, um, and I'm talking the whole time. Not a surprise to any of you who watch my channel. I'm talking the whole time because I just keep thinking, if I stop talking, if I just lay here, I'm going to die. Um, and uh, at one point, and I don't know if this was an out-of-body experience, I don't know. But um, I do know that at one point I'm lying there, like trying, like trying to breathe. And it's just like, I can't really describe it. It's just, I, I could, physically could not draw a breath. It, it was just, it was killing me. And uh, in my mind's eye, all I saw, I didn't see a tunnel, but I just, I just saw blackness. And in front of me, I just visualized this rolling black oily form. This is just, I'm sure my mind, no oxygen, shock, uh, but this slowly revolving form of something black and oily. I mean, it's just all I can, that's how I can, um, describe it. I'm sure it wasn't a tunnel or anything because we'll see if I go to heaven. I've done some stuff. Um, so um, I, I don't remember much after that, honestly. They must have wheeled me off to surgery. Uh, and um, I came out of surgery. I woke up at some point. I had a lot of um, anesthesia. And uh, I was in an uh, ICU for six more days. I had uh, chest tubes, two of them, uh, in my chest, uh, in this lung, I guess, so to drain all the fluid. Um, what's, what's mildly amusing is before this happened, I had been taking prerequisite courses at a junior college uh, in Charlestown, uh, Charlestown to um, look into going into nursing because that was one of my thoughts. I'd always wanted to be a nurse. Well, not always, but I thought it'd be a great thing to do. And so I had been planning on going to nursing school. And uh, I had taken these prerequisite courses. And here I was in ICU with a catheter. I didn't really realize I had a catheter until later uh, when they took it out. Um, that was interesting. Um, and I had these chest tubes and all the things they were doing. <clears throat> I knew, I know now, that I would not have been a good nurse. I don't like copious amounts of blood, body fluids that were very strange. Um, the fluids that came out of my chest were gathering in this container on the floor um, that was like the color of a Bellini. It was just a very unusual, but pretty color as well. But it was like a Bellini, that roseate, tangerine kind of weird color. Um, so I was, yeah, I was in the ICU for a week. Um, I couldn't turn. I couldn't um, rest on any either of my side. I had to sleep on my back, which I can't do. Uh, and uh, I had a morphine, a button for morphine. How much fun is that? So I pushed the button when I was in pain. The hard part is that when you're on morphine, at least my experience, when it would wear off, and the pain came back so fast. It was like a surprise. I didn't know when to push it to stop the pain from coming back. So it was just this roller coaster of pain and then nothing. Pain and then nothing. It was just awful. Um, I had some visitors. I had a fair number of visitors. My mother came to visit, um, which was not good. My aunt. Patty came to visit, and it turns out she 
discovered she had cancer like the next week. Uh, she's passed away since. Um, and I had lots of my friends from um, the recovery group, uh, recovery community come and visit me. But those only those people who knew my last name could visit me in the hospital. Um, and, you know, in recovery, everyone knows you by your first name and maybe your first initial. Uh, Hi, my name is Steven. I'm an alcoholic. That's all I know. So when they came to visit me in the hospital, because I was a violent a victim of a violent crime, boy, this video was already long, I'm sorry. Because I was a victim of a violent crime, they could not tell anybody if I was in the hospital or not, if I was even a patient. Um, so only those people who knew my last name. So my friends quickly learned my last name if they didn't already know it. Uh, and many of them visited, which is wonderful, but I was very tired. Uh, and... Um, I couldn't handle visitors for very long, but my sponsor never left my side. Um, so, you know, I got out after a week, six days in ICU, um, but my housemates were all away. I had two housemates at the time. Um, I did not know my landlord's phone number and uh, my house keys are gone. They're, they're gone. They were in that bag. I had nowhere to stay. I literally had nothing. I had... But, I say I have nothing, but, so my wallet was gone, my keys were gone, everything is gone, but I have a higher power. Some people call it, say God, some people say Jesus, I say, some say Buddha, I say my, my higher power, whom I occasionally call, hey you, um, was watching out for me. Um, I had my phone, I didn't have a charger, but I had my phone, and in my pocket, I had two $100 Amex gift cards that my boss had given me as a gift for working really, really hard. And um, so while I had no money, I had $200 uh, gift cards in my pocket. So I had spending money until I could get my wallet, my license back, my debit card, things like that. So I had some spending money um, and I had my phone and I, I had what I needed at the time. And what I also had was fellowship. Someone in recovery knew that I had nowhere to go. I couldn't get into my apartment. So I didn't know him from Adam, but he said, you're staying at my place. And so for two weeks, I slept on one of his recliners. I couldn't wash. I couldn't shower for like almost two weeks because they didn't want my incision getting wet. They had three, six staples. They had six staples on that, that um, scar, which is like this big I really wish they had used more staples because those six got very itchy. They're they're not very comfortable. Um, but it, you know, it was two weeks before I could actually um, take those bandages off. And thank God I had someone there with me at the time because I didn't I didn't want to see the wound. You know, um, I didn't want to see it. Um, I needed someone to be there with me. So thank God I had someone there with me who could actually help me take these bandages off and then help me, you know, um, take care of myself for the first couple of weeks. Um, and then, you know, um, it, I didn't really leave the house probably for about a month, not because I was afraid to, just because I was just tired and I was breathing <laughs> like I was taking Lamaze classes, uh, because my diaphragm, they had to like, I think they literally had to like roll it up like a lunch bag and suture it across the top because my diaphragm was tight. It was so tight and I couldn't breathe. It had no flexibility. Um, and so I just couldn't even walk. Uh, but when I could finally, when I did decide to finally um, try to exercise and try to walk and try to breathe, you know, um, I decided to go for a walk to the house of the people who had um, initially been there to save me. It was probably four or five blocks away from where I was staying. And so I set out on my walk and it was very hard because I would get a couple hundred feet and I'd have to stop and I'd have to breathe and I'd have to rest. And it was very frustrating. And I got very, very angry because at this time I was 39 years old. There's no reason I couldn't, I shouldn't be able to just walk, but my body wasn't letting me. So I got myself there finally, and while the parents weren't there, and I'll tell you why in a moment, it goes back to the shaved head of the guy who helped me, um, but their sons were in the in the backyard working on a car, and so I came in the back and I said, hi, you know, 
Uh, my name is Steven. Um, your parents uh, helped save me the other uh, a few weeks ago um, when I was stabbed. And they were like, oh my God, they were so worried about you and blah, 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 blah. And we had a little conversation and I, I expressed to the, to the sons, please tell your parents, uh, thank you for me. And um, uh, the apparently their father uh, was going through stage four cancer, brain cancer. That's why his head was shaved. Uh, and um, he was actually in the hospital having an operation done. And his mother was there at the hospital. That's why they weren't at the house. Uh, and so I, you know, I wish the children, uh, their sons, uh, all the best for their parents, of course. Uh, and I found that they said that the mother was selling the house uh, because this is not the first time someone showed up on their front door bleeding. Uh, and so... Uh, it was time to go, you know, with, with her husband's illness and um, just me, one more, you know, wounded person rolling up on their front porch. Um, and I went up in the front and I wanted to remember this all a few minutes ago. I walked up to the front door, up a few wooden steps, up to their small wooden porch. And the whole, the whole thing was spattered with little drops of uh, what was left over of stains of my blood. Um, you know, like that, that round spot with a little teeny do droplets around it that were all over, the, all over the place. And um, it was just something really, it was something else to see my blood on that wood. You know, it was just very strange. <sighs> um, and uh, so I recovered. I went back to work. Uh, um, probably three weeks after it happened, uh, cause I couldn't afford not to. Um, um, I had not had health insurance. <laughs> life in, that's a uh, life lesson to always have insurance. I had let it lapse because I really couldn't afford it, honestly. Uh, and I was going to apply for Obamacare and I just didn't. And I didn't think anything was going to happen. So all of this, and no insurance. So the bill that, uh, the bills, the medical bills that piled up afterwards were, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, $180,000, I think, I don't know, which I never, I never paid. I could not. And um, they'll probably never get anything from me. But um, there's got to be some sort of statute about that. <laughs> I hope. Um, so yeah, I went back to work and uh, because I really wasn't able to, um, I wasn't hungry. I didn't eat almost anything. I didn't have the energy to eat um, for the first couple of weeks. And so I think I lived off of um, Progresso lentil soup. I would have like one can a day. So, you know, that's, I don't know, 300 calories, 400 calories in a can. So that for like two or three weeks, I lost probably 35 pounds uh, in weight. And uh, I was able to breathe a little bit more. To this day, I still struggle. You know, you'll, you'll frequently hear me <clears throat> making little coughs like this because sometimes it's still tricky. Um, and uh, yeah, so I lost weight. And because I lost weight, I could now go to the gym because <laughs> in the past I had not gone to the gym because I didn't want to be the the fat guy on the treadmill, you know, because I didn't know back then that the fat guy on the treadmill is super, super, super brave um, to get up there and do it in front of everybody. You know, I just was so self-conscious of my body at the time, but I was afraid to even work out. Uh, but now that I was thinner, um, I started working out more, which definitely helped me recover um, my breathing to a, a good degree. And, uh, and life went on. Uh, I still, to this day, do not like anybody behind me. Uh, if you're in line at the grocery store, too close behind me, I will move up or I'll back up a little bit until you have to back up. Then I'll move forward. Um, if I'm walking up or downstairs and you're walking too close behind me, I'm going to pull to the side to the railing, pretend to fix my shirt or something until you walk past me. Um, I don't like other people behind me. And if you startle me, warning, if you work with me, don't do this. It's happened. Uh, but people will go, boo, from behind because it's funny. Ha ha. No, because I'm going to turn and I'm going to swing. 
happened. It's happened. I haven't connected. I haven't hit anybody, but it's not, it's, it's surprising for everybody. Um, so, you know, I learned a lot and this video is already 35 minutes long. I do apologize. Um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. There's a couple things I learned. Number one, I am not afraid of almost anything anymore. Um, it, the big things, if I had cancer, if I got HIV, if I, if something horrible, horrible happens, if I'm going to die, I think I'm going to be okay. If I miss a bus, oh, I lose my mind. I'm so irritated. But the big things, you know, I almost died. And I got to tell you, having done that does free you up from a lot of weird fear. So there's, there's that. Um, and I learned at the time also, and I hope to keep practicing it, is to um, accept other people's help when you need it. This is very funny that it echoes today. Accept other people's help when you need it, even if you're uncomfortable accepting help. And I say that's weird now that it's echoing now is that people, uh, subscribers have actually helped me take care of Buddy's medical bills, you know, and to accept that help is very, very strange. Um, but uh, I've learned through this experience being, you know, almost dying that uh, when I was unable to care for myself, to let other people care for me. And that's a big gift because um, I know what it's like to care for other people and be there when they need them. To be the person who needs help isn't comfortable, <laughs> oddly enough. But I did learn a degree of uh, willingness to accept other people's help. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other life lessons I learned. I think this is so, sort of a joke, but I say to many people, I, I think that everyone should get... Um, um, Get married once, get divorced once, everyone should almost die once, everyone should work retail for at least two years or serve in the military. You will learn every life lesson possible. <laughs> so I've done all of these things. So I'm pretty much a grandmaster, right? Um, all right, so this video is way wicked, wicked too long. Um, and so there you go. Guys, if you're a subscriber and or a frequent viewer, I hope this video wasn't too... Uh, grotesque. Uh, but I sort of feel like some of you could handle this video. And um, I, as this channel develops, I really like the idea of you guys getting to know more about me. And this is, this is uh, something that really has shaped me as a person. Uh, and um, so if you subscribe to my channel, thank you. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed, but you still watch my videos, go ahead click that subscribe button. I just love seeing that number um, uh, get larger and larger. It's really, really enormously satisfying and it does validate um, why I make some of these videos. So I hope I haven't overshared. I probably have, um, but um, there you go. All right, so I'm gonna stop talking because this is now looking at almost 40 minutes. All right, so typically I say fly safe. Just be safe, <laughs> appreciate your life, and take care of other people when you can, okay? All right, I'll talk to you later. Bye.